What's up, survivors? It's Shinobi, and during this global pandemic apocalypse, we are bringing you Block Digest 210, the season finale, at block height 617,101, today, Wednesday, February 12th. So, Janine, is your bunker nice and comfy today? That was a very enthusiastic intro, and uh, yes, my, quote, bunker is comfortable. <laughs> Well, uh, better be ready to ride it out there. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say uh, the Communist Party's infection numbers and the data coming out of China is complete horseshit, and people should be acting accordingly. And, yeah, I mean, that's really all I have to say rather than the uh, the usual long virus dialogue we've been having at the start of episodes. Yeah, we've been introing past three episodes with this stuff but um the good news is we're probably all going to be dead by the time the next season starts so you won't have to hear it again but um but yeah it's uh take basic hygiene precautions uh don't be an idiot and uh see where things go but yeah i think uh to start off today we have a very very long tale of uh, something that I think even blows my mind a little bit to the degree that governments just pull shenanigans and get away with it for insane lengths of time. So um, the Washington Post dropped uh, an article yesterday and over the past day or so, um, you know, this has been circulating everywhere about a company, Crypto AG, that was based out of Switzerland um, and actually has been around since World War II uh, and got their start building kind of very small portable um, cipher machines for use in the field with troops. Um, and it is very weak cryptographically. You know, it's the kind of thing that you could break in in a few hours or a day or two, but the, it, it didn't matter because the whole thing was just troop movements like you send your message you move and by the time that's actually broken um the the status on the ground is changed so it, it was kind of a situation where somewhat weak cryptography actually still had utilitarian value um but see the thing is it's just come out that pretty much through this entire company's history um and it went on to have a very long history of building encryption machines and technology after World War II was owned and operated um, by the CIA and the German, I think, BND is their, their intelligence services and mm -hmm. was used to sell um, compromised cryptographic machines to governments all over the world. And yeah, the, the, the story, I'll, I'm, I'm going to try to get through this as quick as possible. It's a really long winding story, but I, I think it's really important to kind of touch on some of the key, um, you know, pivotal moments in it. And to kind of start is the, the man who started this company, um, he came to America and actually produced the, these wartime um encryption devices for soldiers and then went back to switzerland after the war and continued making these machines and the the u.s government was immediately um concerned about that in that they did not want a a free market entity creating actual strong um cryptographic tools 
that they would be selling to other governments. Like that means the United States would not be able to actually compromise and analyze the the communications to their enemies and allies. <laughs> and so the CIA pretty much approached this man and convinced him to let them buy out um, some influence in the company and convinced him to, um, at first, not really mess with anything, just not sell the stronger cryptographic algorithms and, and those machines to certain countries. So this arrangement just started with a don't sell the, the good stuff to people we don't want you selling it to. And at some point in, in the operations, um, the German and French intelligence found out this program existed and approached the owner of this company um, to, to create a relationship between them, which he took to the CIA and refused to act on. And then later, um, the German intelligence services came to him and asked them to go to the US and the CIA and negotiate some kind of involvement for the German intelligence services. And that ended up happening with the condition that France um, was, was not allowed to, to kind of get in on this. And this quickly started developing to actually compromising the algorithms implemented in these machines rather than just only selling weaker machines to certain people. And one of the biggest kind of dynamics going on here was America just wanting to use it everywhere. Ally, enemy, who gives a shit? Sell them one of the compromised machines if you can get them to buy it. And that was always a kind of a dividing dynamic between the American agencies involved and the German agencies who did not like the fact that, that America was pushing them to, to spy on allies and friends as opposed to just enemies. And th this, th this, this program was so enormous that it, it pretty much compromised every major country that America has any kind of intelligence interest in aside from China and Russia, who were just too paranoid to engage in any way with any kind of Western connected company for this kind of stuff. So th there's actually like during the Falkland Wars, when Britain and um, Argentina were at war, they were using these machines. We were feeding intelligence to the British. During the Iranian um, hostage incident in the 80s, we, we were listening to what the Shah said. There, there was even a, um, a bombing of a, a German discotheque in West Berlin, I think, um, that was done by Libya. And we knew they were involved in this because of this program. President Reagan actually um, almost exposed this program by publicly calling out um, Libya's involvement with that bombing and that America had irrefutable evidence of their involvement. And, you know, th this is just how deep this went since World War II. And it kind of went through this iterative dynamic where over time, you know, things became digital as opposed to mechanical. And so there was a huge period there where the, the program was almost compromised because it, it was a whole different engineering game to try to have a, a backdoored digitized machine versus a mechanical thing. So whole new experts were brought into the company to compromise the, this new type of, of machine. And you know, it got to the point where employees were starting to openly get suspicious. Um, there, there was an instance of, um, I, f I forget his name, but one employee literally went to Syria, I think I believe it was, who was using one of these machines and actually fixed the vulnerability that allowed the NSA to break the, the encryption algorithm used um, because he was just unaware of, of the entire purpose of this company and what it was doing. And he just, oh, here's a problem. And he fixed it. And all of their communications went dark. And you know the, this continued until the, the 90s um, during this period then the German intelligence services pretty much pulled out, um, sold off their shares in the company to the CIA and kind of the, their 
assessment there was like that this is getting too too many close calls like this is public exposure being risked and through the whole program's history they were not comfortable with how willing america was to spy on even its allies and most of the the deep history of this this kind of goes dark until 2018 when the company was actually shut down and sold off and broken into the domestic um, company's assets in Switzerland, which now only sells um, their their technology to the Swiss government and the international assets and services of the company. And like this, this is just like, <laughs> even for me, like almost 60, 70 years this company kept this secret like it, employees were suspicious during the course of it there's even suspicion from foreign governments and the public during different close calls with with intelligence garnered from this being thrown out to the public but like jesus christ like this is a half a century or more supply chain attack on the cryptographic equipment that governments use what's everything else look like yeah, I mean this uh I mean this is a really big story, but the facts of it and the dynamics involved don't surprise me at all because as far as I can tell, it's pretty much always been the case that like there there isn't any government that I've seen that's really taken a strong stance that we like citizens should be allowed to use encryption um end to end encryption um or at least that it should have, you know, golden keys in it and everything for them to access. And I, it doesn't surprise me that, <laughs> that on the one hand, they, they believe that they don't believe their own citizens should have privacy, but then they themselves take steps to use the same tools to, uh, I mean, for example, we've seen people in like the U.S. government and probably other governments too using these apps um, to basically keep their messages out of the, you know, FOIA process or make it at least difficult to have those, even though that they shouldn't be doing that, and they're probably uh, skirting a few uh, transparency laws by doing so, but they're going to do it anyway, and. So it doesn't surprise me that governments who are so ignorant about the value of privacy and using these tools would then be duped or be willing to dupe others into using insecure infrastructure because, I mean, as we've seen um, with the with the kinds of attacks uh, over the last 10 years, um, they're not very good at securing a lot of infrastructure even critical stuff like voting so this does not surprise me at all and it's also another reason to be suspicious of any company that either gets funding from a government agency or is run by a government agency as an ngo um just always be suspicious especially if it's not if it's open source you know you can check it um or, well, have an expert check it, but there, therein lies another problem. Um, something I've noticed is that a lot of, you know, actual cryptographers, like, they tend to be uh, also into phys um, physics or mathematics, but a lot of cryptographers I see, they tend to be, at the very least, pro-government, and if not, you know, if, if worse than that, they tend to actually you know, be very willing to work for the government. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me if a bunch of them are compromised and working for companies like this, or they unwittingly are building systems that then get subverted by intelligence agencies for that purpose. So n none of this really comes as a surprise to me. Um, it is kind of amazing that they ca probably the only amazing thing is that they managed to mostly keep it a secret for so long. But yeah, the CIA is not your friend. Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of what really shocks me the most is, you know, I, I kind of glossed through 
like some of the details just to get the the meat of it out um in the first summary of things but like just how this was pulled off i have always felt confident that this type of thing could not be pulled too far or for too long just because of the dynamic that if you are not you know if 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 this is not entirely full of people aware of what's going on eventually people are going to catch on and they're going to call it out and that's what like fucking terrifies me and shocks me is just how well they were able to manage that situation because through the whole history of this the it was always down to the few key people you know, keeping things under lids. And like, you know, th- th- this article from the Washington Post, it points out um, Hagelin was the guy who founded this company. And his original plan was to pass the company on to his son. Um, the CIA did not like that. Um, they viewed his son as an unpredictable wild card. And he died in a car crash that this article just says there, there were no no notions of foul play. I call bullshit. So they, they literally probably killed this man's son to keep this company in the proper hands. During the entire course of the, the early mechanical era of things, it was very simple to, to fuck with things in a way that wasn't you know, immediately evident. But as things started getting digitized, more and more um, you know, people started getting suspicious. Like you can't, you can't mess with a, a digital system in the same type of small nuanced way you can a mechanical one. And so like through the whole course of this company, like this kind of shit was going on. Um, this one woman, I I forget, I'm sorry. I'm I'm just going to use generic pronouns because there are too many names to just pull out of my memory in this article. But like this one woman who was hired, um, without CIA approval immediately freaked the CIA out because like in, in her, in their words, she is too smart to stay unwitting. And she very quickly um, discovered the flaws in the new digital systems, actually implemented um, algorithms so strong, the NSA was just like, there's no way we can break that. And that actually made it into production machines before the, the people in the know at the company realized this and shut it down. And they ended up uh, getting rid of those machines by selling them to American banks to guarantee that they wouldn't fall into any other entity's hands. But, you know, at some point during this this period, they also specifically found a Swiss or no, a Swedish man, I think, who was a very well-known mathematician and cryptographer. And they specifically brought him in as an expert that the engineers at this company would not question in in the same way they were like just design specs that came from random nowhere that they had to follow. And he started designing things specifically so that anything that was caught could be played off as a implementation error. And so it's just the, the way that they actually managed that situation to keep the, the critical mass point of people calling bullshit from ever happening. Like I, I never thought in my wildest dreams that you would be able to keep that type of operation in check like that for 50, 60 years. Like, that, that's fucking crazy to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess because when you're talking about people who have the expertise to actually evaluate these things and find these vulnerabilities, it's a small group of people. They're likely to be very intelligent. So basically, the CIA is either going to put resources into you know, convincing them to stay quiet, um, bringing them on to their side, or they're going to spend resources getting rid of anyone who wasn't going to do that. So, I mean, when we're talking about the CIA, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me too much, you know, if they actually engaged in, you know, a lot more, uh, shall we say, uh, illicit activities than is probably even mentioned or suggested in the article, then, yeah, um, it would be relatively easy for them to, I mean, th- this is, that's their, that's what they do every day in a whole bunch of other areas. So it doesn't surprise me. And also the, the people that the, because you're dealing with a small group of people, the, 
the government, even if they had any suspicions of their own, which most of them wouldn't because they're, they're public officials and don't have that kind of skepticism, uh, and anyone they would, if, you know, they, if they went to and find an expert to like evaluate it, it would probably be, be, it would probably be one of these people that has been signed off by the CIA to go and do that work for them to be a consult. So yeah, I mean, it is amazing that it lasted so long, but it's also the CIA <laughs> and they are used to doing this kind of stuff. Still kind of fucking crazy though. Ah, oh, man, but yeah, it's like this, this is, there's no way this is anything except the tip of the iceberg of the types of op or operations like this that were going on during these time periods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I'm pretty much beat up on this one. Uh, you want to jump into the next one? Yeah, the uh, the next one is just a uh, kind of happy birthday to open privacy because I think it was yesterday, uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis tweeted that they're now two years old and they published a blog post just summarizing some of the things that they've been doing in the past two years, which is quite a lot. Um, the f first major one, which mentioned before on the show and um, I've been following is that um, people at Open Privacy and also researchers at the University of Melbourne and UC Levain, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but they uh, found critical vulnerabilities in the e-voting systems uh, used by Switzerland and Australia, or at least the e-voting systems that were going to be used. Um, I think in Australia they were actually used. Um, the vulnerabilities they found um, were basically so terrible. Um, Sarah did a, like a very long talk about all of them and how bad they are. Uh, they were so terrible that at least in Switzerland, there was a suspension of e-voting. And in June of last year, the federal council in Switzerland delayed e-voting altogether because they said they didn't have a viable system to use in federal elections. And in, in that specific year, uh, the federal election coming up was in October. And so they delayed that. And so that's pretty awesome. Uh, unfortunately, Swiss Post ha decided to hold back on the uh, bounty money, which they initially claimed was at least 100,000 Swiss francs. And I don't remember the exact amount, but I think they only gave um, this team, uh, Open Privacy plus the uh, university researchers, they only gave a total of 5,000 francs to them, even though they found, like, I don't know if there was anyone else who found bugs, but they probably found the majority of them and they basically just didn't get any money. They got 5,000 francs total, and I think half of that went to open privacy. So that really sucks. Uh, funnily enough, when Sarah was going around Switzerland um, talking about these vulnerabilities, she I think she actually raised more money from donations that people gave um, during those talks than she got from Swiss Post, which is really disgusting. Uh, the second thing is that they've been working on a um, they've been working on a messaging application called Sea Witch. Uh, I think it, well, it's a Welsh word, so it's pronounced differently. But I've just been saying Sea Witch, uh, C W T C H, and um, basically it's supposed to be an encrypted uh, encrypted messaging platform that uh, specifically tries to also protect metadata and allow for anonymous identities. It's really cool. And so that's something they've been working on over the past two years. And I think it has, I think it's still an alpha. Yeah, I think it's still an alpha. Um, but you obviously, if you want to try it out, it's up and running and you can um, send bug reports and stuff and that would help them. Uh, another thing uh, they found, which I think was a story a few times on the show, um, or at least once, is that they noticed that um, the paging systems between hospitals in Canada, specifically the Vancouver Coastal Health Group, uh, 
basically the the paging systems were sending sensitive medical records uh, unencrypted and could you know could be intercepted by you know a, a radio or anything like that and it took a very long time for them to do anything about it once it was reported um I think they write in the blog post that they only took the breach seriously when we contacted a journalist nine months later. So they reported it and then they waited more than nine months to do anything. And the last thing is just they've started an OPSEC uh, consultation program to help, because uh, specifically Open Privacy wants to build tools for uh, marginalized people, people at risk who aren't usually served or listened to by a lot of the messaging applications and so they want to provide consultation at risk people you know how to protect their digital privacy their digital life so those are four things that they've worked on over the past two years they've done quite a lot for the amount of money that they've managed to raise mm -hmm. yeah I actually what she's one of the few people in like the opsec space i follow and, and i kind of realized uh, hilariously the other day that like most of the op infosec people i follow are women and, and i have no idea why why that wound up that way but um i, I can tell you why because <laughs> there's a lot of women in that space um i mean i don't okay we're I trying not to make me sound like a pig janine okay that's what we're trying to do here <laughs> no, I'm no, I, I'm not. I'm not thinking of a a piggish reason. Um, I mean, I don't know what the ratio, the actual ratio is of men and women in information security, but um, I've also noticed that the, I don't know, I feel like the most, the most comprehensive, and you know, good thinkers. Uh, about information security tend to be women just because the the threats that women face online are more diverse i guess honestly and i think it's just that like out of the the men in that space i follow versus the women like the women just like here's a problem i explain it whereas like all the dudes are incapable of not trolling like me <laughs> Yeah. but yeah it's like she she does a lot of good stuff in this space and i think that organization is something that there should be a lot more of out there mm -hmm. all righty so are we ready for a sticky topic oh god what kind of sticky okay get your mind out of the gutter woman <laughs> um so there was some criticism regarding Taproot dropped to the Bitcoin mailing list. Um, it, it was posted by Brian Bishop, although he's pretty much just relaying messages that were sent to him um, out of band. Um, and yeah, mm. I think let, I'll start with the, the technical side of things first. Um, pretty much the, the real short TLDR here is they are kind of nitpicking a little bit of the privacy and the efficiency designs. Um, specifically, the notion that having kind of the, the top level schnorr key that you don't need any Merkle root data for um, as the, the primary way to spend is more efficient than having a branch with Merkle data um, below that that's just a very short branch so they're they're kind of questioning the assumption that um hiding mast under schnorr um is actually more efficient as well they're they're kind of looking at um the the way that you can th there's kind of the the nums functionality where you can tweak a key the the top level schnorr key and create a, a taproot mass tree under that and have that top level be like an invalid like thing you can't spend. And they're kind of questioning the the design rationale for how that's accomplished um, and whether that could potentially lead to privacy leaks. And then mostly they're, they're kind of getting into like, why are we bundling 
Schnorr and Taproot together as opposed to just doing Mast on its own and then Schnorr on its own and then Taproot on its own and Craftroot on its own. And here's where I'm going to kind of get into the non-technical sides of this. Um, why are they bringing up graft root? Um, that's not in scope for the current taproot proposal. It's similar functionality and it builds on the same things, but it has nothing to do with the three bips put forward for Schnorr and taproot right now. And what is with the obsession of masked on its own when that that is an absolute privacy loss like the, 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 these people air quote um literally make the argument we can just have mast and schnorr be their own broken smaller anonymity sets rather than have a single global one and it's it's kind of this right now um i think this is bullshit like I, 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 I don't think that we should just dismiss and refuse to engage in criticism put out this way because it's important. Like you look at the criticism itself, not the source. But that said, I, I think the, all the contextual signs of this are just concern trolling bullshit to waste time. Because if you really get down to it, um, the first sentence, now that the BIP has moved to draft, we felt now was the time to prioritize the review. We just had a ridiculously extended review period for all of this, where literally people were having in-person meetups all over the world to go through the specifications for all of this and audit all of this shit. And they wait until that review period is done to, to put this criticism, like, bullshit. And then the entire line of reasoning as to what should be done instead is a separate fork for Mast and then a separate fork for Schnorr and a separate... Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, this is concern trolling bullshit. And if, if you want to really see the, the technical responses to this, and in the show notes, there's a response to this from Anthony Towns, um, which kind of goes through why a lot of these concerns are nonsense. Like, the idea that having a, a top level schnorr path that doesn't require merkle roots isn't more efficient that that's fucking absurd and so you know it's it's this is is kind of an issue i think going forward because what's going on right now and what i think you know the reaction should be to this specific criticism is this is nonsensical horseshit this is coming in after the review. Oh, we thought now we should review things and oh, we should break this all up and do things one by one, which would exponentially extend the fucking time horizon to actually deploy, test, roll these functionalities out into the Bitcoin protocol itself um, when the, the reasons for doing so are nonsense. But the, the issue is here, like we should not just because this one piece of criticism is horseshit let that create an attitude that that criticism put forward this way should just be immediately ignored without actually being assessed and looked at like it doesn't matter where the criticism comes from what context you you assess the criticism by its own merits and i am saying that on their own merits these specific criticisms are horseshit and this is clearly i i I have a, a hunch, I think, who this is personally, and I don't believe it's a group. I think it is one individual. I'm not going to say their name publicly because I'm not going to fucking humor this kind of shit. But the point is, is this, I think, is a long-term problem going forward. It, it's We have to be cautious and look at every criticism for major changes like this. But at the same time, look at the history of this space and developments here. There are going to be a long list of butthurt people whose specific proposals got passed up on because something better came along or there, there were just trade-offs that, that weren't acceptable to everybody at large. And every single one of those developers can do this, can just concern troll and drop criticism for whatever proposals or, or developments that everybody actually is getting consensus for and try to drag it down. And so that's something I think going forward, everybody in this ecosystem needs to be very careful of. Like we, we need to actually look at criticism and assess it and see whether there's merit or not. 
But we also have to be aware that this is a denial of service vector to just slow down development of the space altogether. And we, we need to we need to kind of thread the needle in the middle there and not go too crazy in one direction, not take any criticism from anywhere as stop everything, but not just dismiss any type of criticism because it's saying something we don't want to hear. And so I think, you know, this is something everybody should really like sit and think about is like, how do we deal with a dynamic like this going forward? Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, you got anything to chip in on there, or should we just jump to the next one? Nothing to chip. Alrighty. I thought jobs markets were doing good, Janine. Why is this headline saying the opposite? Uh, well, maybe the the bullshit jobs are uh, getting replaced by some real jobs somewhere. Hmm. That's you up on the next story. Wait, I had consensus layoffs? Yep. Oh, well, I completely forgot about that one. I missed it because I was looking at a different Oh, I I messed it up with <laughs> I I I messed it up with the Reuters one. Um, yeah. So this is kind of related to a later story. But they, uh, I can't remember what episode it was, but uh consensus, I think it was last year at some, last year 2018, they uh did a staff cut. It was quite large. They um cut a bunch of spokes off. Surprisingly, I don't think they cut off the one that I was particularly focusing on, which was the journalism on a blockchain project called Civil. Um, they, for some reason, decided to keep that. But uh, basically, Consensus uh, has recently done another staff cut, which is around 14%, which is quite a lot of people considering um, at one point, they had a thousand people working at their company, which is funny because at certain points of the day of the month, that is more people than are using Ethereum in the entire world. Um, pretty weird. I guess all their users are <laughs> are are in the consumption, um, or not even. And yeah, the reasons. Uh, well. The reasons are pretty similar to last time. They Joseph Lubin is the head honcho, and he doesn't want to give... Well, this isn't the real reason, but I'm speculating that he doesn't want to give out as much money anymore because slowly uh, the Ethereum space is realizing that a lot of the projects that have come out in the last three years are not worth anything. And if they're not outright scams, they're just plain stupid and stupid have no financial viability whatsoever. Um it's me that there are staff cuts. I haven't looked at who's gotten cut, but I have no doubt that the uh Saudi Arabia apologist uh, John Lilick is probably still there. Um and that's about it. Uh more people leaving consensus, not consensus with uh consensus with a Y. Oh uh Oh, SpaghettiOs. Tron's coming for you. Oh, right. Oh, no. Do not bring up that. <laughs> do not do that. I don't want to hear anything more about that. What? You don't know you need Tron to use BitTorrent now? You don't BitTorrent with all the cool kids? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll stop. All right. Let's, let's, let's move along. So, does 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 the name of it have anything to do with the Tron movie? Because that's I haven't even seen that movie, but every time I hear that name, I think of that movie. I'm like, I should probably watch that. What? 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 You have never seen Tron. I have seen the very foggy neon lights of the logo. And I've seen bits and pieces, but I honestly have no idea who is even in it. I just know that it's some dystopia oh my God. world thing. Oh my God! Don't you fucking Kurt Russell! You fucking insult me, Kurt Russell! Are they at all related? That's my only question. We're moving along before I strangle you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh. Indigestion. Craig writes. Never ending story has taken an epically hilarious turn. 
Uh, he is trying to argue that the bonded courier who was supposed to deliver the private keys that were left by Dave Kleiman but only showed up with public addresses is in fact an attorney and therefore all the communications and everything that Craig doesn't decide to turn over can't be subpoenaed because attorney-client privilege. And he, he's trying to pull this or has tried to pull this with over 11 thousand different documents um that have been subpoenaed for different different uh reasons during the course of this case but like th this just takes the cake like th this really takes the cake the pivotal core point of this trial like this guy who's supposed to show up with the keys and give us more info nope att attorney client privilege no more information you just got to trust me dude it it's it's like like th this case i think is showing everything that's wrong with the american legal system and that is so easy to just denial of service everything and just drag things out into infinity and it's it's fucking absurd i mean like like this this is crazy like he's oh that 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 guy was an attorney so nope you can't get that information like he's tried to pull this this kind of shit how many times like he is just making a joke of the American legal system. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, like the, this is the, there are a lot of fundamental problems here that need to be fixed because it, it is absurd how long this trial has dragged on because of little legal hacks and shit like this. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I, there, I haven't really looked too much into it, but there's been so many stories about, the ridiculous things that Craig Wright has been saying in court and how mad the judge is at him that I think I, I, it wasn't really a nightmare. It kind of is, but I had a, <laughs> I had a very short dream about Craig Wright a few nights ago where I Ew. think, it, no, it's, it's actually hilarious. Um, I'm not, I, I think it, it was a courtroom, but I don't know why I was in there. And that was sort of the funny part of the dream. I, I realized I was in this room and there was a bunch of people in there and Craig Wright was there and I think it was a courtroom. And I just remember feeling, I was so angry. I was like, what am I doing in this room? Why is Craig Wright in this room? Get me out of here. Like I didn't, I didn't know why I was in there. I was just so pissed. And I don't know. I think he had like a walking stick or something and he like, he was like saying something to me or at me and he pointed the stick at me. And I said something like, if you point that stick at me one more time, I'm going to rip your hand off. And then the dream ended. <laughs> so, yeah. So in other words, he's going to be there until he's old and senile and can't walk without the aid of a cane. And this case is never going to end. Well, y you know, the uh, <laughs> there there is that uh, character that he referenced in his Twitter handle that he no longer has, uh, Dr. Faust, where a man sells his soul or you know, he sells his uh, service to the devil in exchange for, I think it's knowledge or something, it's basically knowledge, and he ends up getting tricked, obviously, and gets, in the end, he's just damned to hell so um being stuck in a courtroom forever sounds like a pretty damn good hell so maybe his uh maybe he's just coming into his character but um well whatever it is uh he's fucking greasy piece of shit and this needs to end <laughs> Yeah, and if I ever end up in the same room with Craig Wright, I'm going to be just as pissed off as I was in my dream. I'm going to just go up to him and be like, I'm Satoshi, you fucking piece of shit. What the fuck are you doing impersonating me? I I look back there. I, I was looking through my old tweets, and I think in 2015, I actually I tweeted something. Uh, it was when he had, you know, been... It was when he had left Australia, or at least left his home in Australia after the Wired article being published. And at that point, I felt, I actually, I didn't know anything about him, and I felt sorry for him. I was like, oh my god, the, you, you people chased him out of his home. Are you happy with yourselves? And I was, ah, oh, so, it's been so long. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy with myself. <laughs> Alrighty. I think, though... 
after these next few stories, some people might not be happy with me. So. Why is that? Well, because I'm going to say a lot of good things about banks. Um, (laughs) Mm. uh, Boffin, the the German uh, financial supervisory authority, um, released guidance last month about the the new kind of regulation scheme for cryptocurrency custody well cryptocurrency custodying that went into effect this year um to kind of go over the landscape and pretty much this whole year is for the most part going to be a limbo period where any any existing crypto uh, business needs to announce their intent to apply for this license by march 31st Um, and then apply for the license actually by November 3rd. And so it's, it's kind of a limbo period here where you cannot actually custody anything unless you were already doing so. So anybody currently engaged in operations is in this kind of limbo. They can keep operating and get the license and and things are fine. But any business that was not already operating um, has to go through the licensure process before they can actually start any kind of uh, custodying or retail services. But the the interesting thing is um, 40 banks have applied and, and you know announced their intent to apply for licenses for this um, well in excess of what the uh, German financial regulators were expecting. Um, and yeah that that that's fucking massive i mean like if if all of these banks get licenses um i don't think any german citizen in the entire country is going to have any issues in the next year or two getting a bank account that that can denominate and and handle bitcoin as well and that is just fucking crazy like just the the regulation passing to enable that on its own was crazy but to see that many banks apply for and show interest in getting a license to offer services like that that's even fucking crazier like in the next one to two years the entire population of germany is going to be opened up to seamless ownership and interaction with bitcoin through the conventional financial companies and services they use That, that that's fucking crazy like that is Bitcoin mainstreaming. Well, it'll be available to ger- people in Germany and Germans that are even able to get a bank account in the first place or even want to get a bank account, which um, a relatively significant percentage don't want to have a bank account for a variety of reasons. Um, primarily being that you can use cash pretty much everywhere, even for trains. Um, so there's less of a dependence on credit cards and debit cards. So, and then there's also the fear of like, Hey, you're, the bank is holding your money and could take it away. So better maybe not do that. Yeah. But you know, just to think about it purely in terms of on ramping, like you can just open a bank, get your Bitcoin, pull it out whenever you want. And I mean, like in, inside five years, they're going to have things like multi-sig vaults, more complex shit like that. I mean, like, the, the, like there's no way that a bank is going to jump into this space and not start looking at how they can extend their services with the new type of functionality that Bitcoin has. And so it's just like ultimately like, yeah, the, the, the trust model is, is not something most people listening to us are going to be comfortable with. But a lot of people out there will. And over time, as these types of institutions really learn what you can do with Bitcoin, that trust model can improve radically versus what it's going to start off as. Yeah, I mean, we kind of, I talked about this several episodes ago, but I think that if negative interest rates increasingly become a thing, which at least in Germany, there have been a few, um, as far as I've heard, a few consumer level banks um, or at least consumer servicing banks that have implemented that um, there's going to be a conflict between those policies and customers being able to acquire bitcoin and move it in and out at will 
at any point um, because, yeah, that's going to be a bit of a fun time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's like that's, you know, it's kind of I think it's a good jump point to the next story um, kind of related. Uh, BitGo <clears throat> recently expanded a presence. Um, I think two days ago they made the announcement. Um, they've established an entity BitGo GmbH in Switzerland and BitGo Deutschland GmbH in Germany to extend their uh, custodial services to Europe, which is something that they've been seeing a lot of demand for in, in the last couple of years. And like this, <clears throat> you know, just on the surface is like, okay, there are experienced custodians, um, you know, whatever you want to take away with Bitco's history from that, moving into Germany, where these regulation changes are happening regarding banks. So that that alone right there is, is a nice synergy. But like, really think about this. Okay, Bitco has a registered legal entity in the States. Now they have one in Switzerland. Now they have one in Germany. What's to stop all of those entities spreading the control of coins in a multi-sig held by each independent entity in three different jurisdictions? Where if the, you know what, like, can you see where I'm going here? Like if enough jurisdictions to pass a multi-sig threshold don't all order their respective like legal entities to sign off on something, then think about the kind of potential you have there for jurisdictional arbitrage with just custodian of or custodying of assets that just things like banks are holding. Like you could have a bank in Germany holding Bitcoin for people, but the actual custodying of that is handled by a legal entity in Germany, a legal entity in Switzerland, a legal entity in the United States, all in a multi-sig. And now you need to actually get legal action taken in multiple countries before those funds can be accessed. Like you you no longer have the option to just go after whatever the the customer facing entity is based in like going to that jurisdiction you have to go to the multiple jurisdictions where the actual keys holding those assets are and like if, if they go in a direction like that that could get really fucking interesting for how custodial services in this space work like i mean like re really think about that like if the if german court goes like give us these bitcoin and they send a subpoena to the german incorporated version of bitgo but that's not enough <laughs> because the the switzerland branch and the american branch can just say no until they get served with a legal court order so now the the barrier to to take that kind of legal action can be raised as high as, as you want to distribute those keys around between different countries well considering the integration of law enforcement between those countries i would say that the barrier is only the speed of an email or airmail because a lot of that tends to not get much pushback well yeah with outright criminal shit but i mean like look at the the edge cases of like you know just trying to take somebody's money over some ridiculous nonsense or some civil shit like why why the fuck does does the court system in Switzerland care about some civil complaint against some German guy? That's not our problem. Oh, it's just, I think, I think there is some very interesting potential there. Assuming you can get a company structure set up like this ran by people who will actually fight back legally as far as they can. Like that could add a lot more resilience to these types of just normal custodial institutions. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, what do we got next? That's back to you again. Yeah, so we get to the story that I had actually remembered. Uh, so <laughs> um, Reuters is reporting that JP Morgan is possibly planning to pass off Quorum. Their, I believe it must be a private blockchain. It doesn't explicitly say in the article, I don't think. But they basically use a well it's, i think it's a copy of the ethereum network or it's a private blockchain that uses the ethereum network um they say it uses the ethereum network um 
and it's been used by JP Morgan to run the interbank information network, which is a payment network between 300 banks. And um, it's also the uh, infrastructure on which they were originally planning to launch JP Morgan coin because that's not a giant, that hasn't been a giant meme. Um, but basically they've, they want to pass it along. Um, who knows what the reason is? They don't explicitly say it, but probably it's because this is another boring as shit private blockchain that no one actually cares about. It isn't very interesting and maybe they don't have the, they probably haven't found enough people to keep working on it or it's not making them enough money and so they want to pass it along to someone else and one of those prospective uh organizations that they want to pass it along to is consensus and so it says uh jp morgan has been considering spin spinning off quorum for around two years evaluating options including setting up an open source foundation lol creating a new startup or merging it with another company. A merger with consensus was chosen as the best path forward as both organizations work with Ethereum and have been involved in joint initiatives in the past. Now, it's not clear what this information is based on because, once again, it's mainstream media. They just say a person said. So this could just be someone from consensus who uh, knows that they're possibly thinking thing go and merging and you know going to the media saying that they have in inside information and you know they've been talking about giving it to consensus like who knows who's saying this but it honestly would not surprise me at all if if a uh, big uh, ethereum company like consensus would just take on some more bloatware from a bank uh, right when they're cutting staff and still not quite focusing on the right things or at least you know focusing on things like the AWS of the blockchain world which is Infura because the Ethereum network can't run anymore uh, at least can't run decentralized so you know, surprise me if it happened because consensus doesn't have any taste in actual interesting projects so who knows um wouldn't surprise me at all but also don't know if this is just you know pushing the envelope excellent everything is going according to plan <laughs> but seriously like i i have been calling this for years and i think this is the first step along the only path that Ethereum has to not just implode on itself and die. And that is to realize that it's unscalable, inefficient, is never going to work as an open blockchain system and just turn it into a scripting system for centralized financial databases where you can prove little things to the other database operator with zero knowledge proofs, but it's just everybody's keeping their own database. Because it, it's yep. like what that—that's all there is to to the viability path for Ethereum, and I think this is the first kind of inklings of of that realization finally showing results. Yep, Ethereum is only going to survive as a corporate coin. That's about it. Mm -hmm. All right. So what else we got up? Backed. So uh. Yeah, Backed has made their first real move in kind of getting away from the institutional stuff that they started out with and moving towards a little more consumer facing. So they have acquired a company, Bridge2 Solutions, a major uh, platform that handles like kind of loyalty points, airline miles, like different, it's, it's pretty much a different payment solution for all the types of non currency type of things like loyalty points, gift cards, uh, in-game points and things like that. And they're planning on rolling out, you know, a payment app. Like we've all been saying for as long as backed has been a thing we've known about. 
And it's just the next logical step in their whole ecosystem they're building. Like they've started out with the futures product, actually physically settled, derivatives built up around that. And now what's the long play? To have a payment system so people can actually spend cryptocurrency that connects into that backend settlement system so that businesses don't have to deal with the volatility. Because, I mean, yeah, like a small business, I might want to hold Bitcoin. I do hold Bitcoin and keep it. You know, I have a small business. But the point is, a major company cannot just open the doors to cryptocurrency payments. And if that actually does become a large volume, just eat the volatility. That cannot happen. So this is like, this is Bax's whole play. And, you know, I think in the next year or two, we're going to see a wallet pop up someplace you can hold your Bitcoin balance and a really big PR campaign from companies like Starbucks, like Bact, like Microsoft, actually trying to push for retail payment use of Bitcoin. I mean, it's it's just a matter of time at this point. It's like they have the, the platform, the software, they just need to re-engineer things to actually work with Bitcoin and boom. So... <laughs> Yeah, expect this in the near future. German banks custodying crypto, fucking Wall Street, Bitcoin payment apps coming. Like, you might not like the look of it, folks. This is what mainstreaming looks like. Doesn't mean I'm going to jump in the water. That's the beauty. You don't have to if you don't want to. So speaking of mainstreaming things, um... What's this disappointing news I hear about a previously promising looking company? Uh, well, there is there has been an app called Lolly, which I've never used, but I've seen a few people tweet about it because it's basically a rewards program for using Bitcoin with merchant services. Um, they claim in their bio that they work with a uh, 750 top merchants i think that's what it says and so it's it's a custodial app um you don't hold your keys but um up until recently uh it hasn't involved too much kyc it's one of those kyc light applications um but i noticed that matt odell uh, was sharing a message. I don't know if it's one sent to him. It might be, but he doesn't specifically identify who it was sent to. But someone from Lolly, uh, they're going by Drew Walker, says um, that this person's account was flagged as matching characteristics of fraudulent behavior. This does not mean you have done anything wrong, but simply that our system flagged your account as such. By law, we are required to adhere to U.S. regulation known as Know Your Customer to establish the identity of any person withdrawing funds out um, of the application. So, yeah, he, he basically points out that they're, they're selectively applying KYC to certain people and not able to explain why. Now, this isn't entirely novel. Um, there are some even, you know, decentralized exchanges that require you to, you know, plug into the reputation system with an identity in certain situations where, you know, like mediation is required. There's a there's a dispute and that needs to be done, but that's not a requirement. That's that's a you know, an extreme situation, but it's kind of suspicious that an application would say well your account has been flagged we can't tell you why but you need to give us your personal information that's the kind of thing like there's i I get spam at certain email addresses i get spam emails all the time from services that claim you know oh you know your account has been doing something weird or you need to do this step to verify it like this is a very spammy kind of action it's probably what they're actually doing i don't i don't know it appears like it's um something that they actually do and it's not just someone pretending to be lolly but it's just i it's it's a very bad reason to apply 
KYC is that, oh, our algorithm doesn't like you. Give us your data. Um, I wouldn't comply with that. So, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Another centralized app uh, is engaging in scummy behavior and whether or not it's required by law to selectively apply KYC to people based on algorithmic decisions. Uh, I don't really care. I'm just not going to use it. I don't really care about, you know, my, my, <laughs> my personal information is worth more than a few sats back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sitting here and thinking about this, I'm betting it was probably something to do with like credit card fraud or something like they have some kind of algorithm for like if you just sign up and then instantly buy a bunch or like a lot in a row or something. And it's, you know, I, I feel the same way as you, but like as a company, there's really no way around that. But like th there are things like something you can do. I mean, like you, you, you could at least put clearly somewhere in the terms, like you, sometimes we're just going to have to be like, give us the information and we have to do that sometimes, like at least explicitly lay that out as a, a possible risk. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, if anyone wants to do that, whatever, your policy is clear and I'll just avoid you knowing that that's what you'll do. But they don't, they don't appear to have done that. They just kind of say, you've been flagged. Um, and in order to keep using your account, in order to take out your money, uh, they're, they're basically holding your money hostage unless you, you fulfill this requirement that you didn't know of before and is being, you know, could be rather arbitrary in terms of you being subjected to it. Um, I, that doesn't, I don't like that at all. I don't like this randomness like if if they have a problem with you to the point where they won't even let you withdraw your own money then they should tell you what the reason is and if they can't their algorithm probably sucks and they shouldn't be using it mm -hmm. oh it's only a matter of time you either die the hero or live to see yourself become the villain so next up or you don't watch tron <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Next thing up is, uh, I think, some really awesome news because personally, I've been kind of worried about the financial viability of this company in the long term, given the size of their first raise and how long it's been. But happy to announce that Lightning Labs raised $10 million from Craft Ventures, Ribbit Capital, RRE, M13, and Slow. I have not heard of all of those companies before, <laughs> but um, yeah, c considering their first raise was only $2 million and they've been able to actually stretch it this long, you know, I think this is a decent amount of runway for them to get going forward. And they've also simultaneously announced the beta release of Loop as a, a service. So starting now, um, if you can get in for the beta they actually will swap your coins in and out of a channel atomically without you having to close it for a fee um i think the the way this works is the fee is kind of skewed asymmetrically so if you are trying to loop coins out of a channel and get them on chain the fee right now is zero or point zero five to point five percent and if you're trying to loop on-chain coins into a channel, it's 0.1% to 1%. And I think the, the logistics behind this are obviously, you know, the, the UTXO condensing problem. Like collecting individual UTXOs and condensing those is going to be more expensive than taking a, a single one and, and fragmenting that again. So there there is, it's not just an asymmetry in the fee you're paying. There's a reflective asymmetry to the cost for them running this but you know this is going to be pretty awesome um i haven't really messed with loop at all just because i have not been tinkering that deeply with you know lightning on a personal level i, I <laughs> until uh i set the one up for uh me and mr hoddle's uh shirt store i had never even run a full node 
like I, I I'm, I'm gonna say right now i just tinkered with the the light wallets and stuff but um you know this now i can play around with this and it's i don't have to actually run this or find a a random node that's playing around with this like it's just an open simple service to use right now and you know i'm betting that a lot more places are going to start popping up offering this as a service and it's it's probably going to get pretty competitive but you know i'm just i'm just happy to say with this you know I am no longer so much worried about Lightning Labs running out of money in the next year or so. I think this is enough runway to keep them going for a long time. And it's pretty awesome to see them finally drop something to, to actually see some revenue start coming in and try to monetize all this stuff they're building there. So it's pretty fucking awesome, and I hope to see some good things. Don't you Sweet. like Lightning? Yes. Don't you want to talk about Lightning for the next five minutes straight? No. Aw. Well, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll jump along to a quick announcement, I and mean, I think it's you um, after that. But uh, Wire BTC uh, announced yesterday they're integrating with Liquid. And now, for the first time ever, what's that? A United States citizen can get their hands on Liquid Bitcoin directly from fiat. Oh, my God. Although I do want to say they do not offer a peg out service. It is one way. Do not use this service unless you can get the Bitcoin out of liquid another way or you don't care if it gets stuck there. Now that said, I think this is pretty awesome because until right now, there really hasn't been any way for anybody in the US to get their hands on liquid besides or liquid Bitcoin except peg it in themselves. And so I think this is going to be pretty cool. Like, let's let's kind of see how this goes. Let's see if there really is any kind of use for this outside of the arbitrage, you know, exchange traders that the platform is mainly targeting they you know there's been a lot of uh big backlash about btc pay integrating liquid but you know now here's a, a simple way for people to get their hands on liquid um you know very small amounts so let's see if that actually puts the two things together and if there's actually interest in using bitcoin on liquid for retail or commercial uses I mean, I'm actually kind of curious to see like how many people out there would actually be comfortable with the different trust model for those kinds of use cases. Not me. That's okay, because you don't have to peg in. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's come on, it's cool. So the side chain confidential transactions, like what is this? Is. Yeah, I I can wait. I can wait for them to come to Bitcoin. Janine, you gotta make it look appealing or I'm not gonna get my paycheck. Oh no. All right, though, trolling aside, um, there is a, a big shitcoin meltdown going on that I have not paid a lick of attention to. You, you wanna catch me up with what's going on? Well, I haven't wanted to pay too much attention to it, but basically, uh, since this since the iota meltdown from 2017 was one of the first uh stories that i covered on block digest all those years ago um i thought it would be good to have this be my last story <laughs> for the season um basically come from beyond left iota or at least he left the iota board the iota foundation board in june i think it's not precise what the date is but he had made a tweet in july saying that he had left last month and i hadn't seen it so he had left sometime over the summer of 2019 and um the reasons he wrote a very long blog post explaining why and uh david zonstabo i don't know how to pronounce his name so i'm gonna say it like that uh, he also wrote a very long blog post in response, uh, but basically it sounds like Come From Beyond uh, kind of branched off and formed his own company called Paracosm, and 
Uh, I mean, at least according to both of their posts, it just seems like, you know, he wanted to work on other things and he wasn't on board with some of the uh, progression milestones that the IOTA Foundation was setting in terms of uh, so-called core decide, which is where they get rid of the coordinator because they shouldn't need it anymore. Still waiting on that one. Um, yeah, basically they had a falling out, and so he left last summer, but then I guess uh, he was supposed, according to Come From Beyond, he was supposed to, uh, he was supposed to get paid out in IOTAs for something. It's not exactly clear, um, but... Yeah, they're basically in a, they, they are in or about to be in a legal dispute. And it's just funny. Uh, the blog posts are very long and they're very, they're all very full of themselves. And David is saying things like, oh, Iota is, you know, too mature and important to be engaging in squabbles like this, blah, blah, blah. So if you want to read all of that, um, you can. It's not very interesting. It's just, People who think that they're very smart with their uh, <laughs> design deci design decisions that no one appreciates, and yeah, they're they're not happy with each other. But that's a good thing in the long run. Go away eventually. Yeah, who could have ever thought that the system architecturally incapable of existing without a central coordinator could just implode on itself? Mm. Yeah, and the the funny part is because uh, we had a, a few episodes. Well, I think that was a few months ago. We had the incident where um, Sarah Jane Lewis, who was mentioned in the second story this episode. Um, they were threatening her because she was one of the people that um, was pointing out flaws in the system and also how shitty these people are. And they were threatening to blackmail her uh, empty threats. I don't think they actually did anything, but they were threatening blackmail in response. And it looks like Come From Beyond was... Uh, he well, he deleted the thread, but I of course found an archived copy, and it's it's linked next to the story in the show notes. Um, basically, he publicly tweeted a bunch of private messages that supposedly proved that uh, David was not a good leader or was misleading about something not important to anyone but their little in group. And uh, he was posting those messages saying that David should apologize. And then once David apologized, he deleted the tweets. But of course, they got archived. So that's kind of pointless. So yeah, it's a very, very fun crowd. You know what? I think that actually made me remember that's probably where I first started following her. Random thing that popped into my head. Yeah, and so Sarah actually, she noticed this going on. Um, yeah. Foundation kept, I guess there was some kind of giveaway of IOTA and a bunch of people didn't claim the tokens and so the foundation just kept them and David was like, well, there was no claim for those tokens, thus they went back to IOTA AS, which is the name of the company. It was not a built-in mechanism, didn't claim, such is life, this has nothing to do with rec reclaims, blah, 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 so... She responded to that by saying, one day I hope a deserving journalist gets a chance to really dig into all the leaks, disclosures, and unreleased financial records of the IOTA Foundation. At a glance, it's really hard to not come to the conclusion that there is rampant criminal fraud afoot. Yep. Ding, 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 ding. Shitcoin's gonna shitcoin. Oh, man. Speaking of shitcoins, these last two stories are gonna be hilarious, I think. Um... They are two companies dragged down into the mud by a shitcoin when they could have otherwise not fell face first into the mud. So let's just go to the first one. Um, Bitcoin.com completely redid their wallet. Closed source now. Um, what's in the, the repos available? Not at all match what's being distributed through the app store. And broke the multi-sig function in the new version of the wallet. 
which is now closed source. And this was all done with no heads up, no warning, no anything. Um, and everybody stampeded into RBTC to go, what, what the fuck is going on? Like they had to pull their, their seeds off and port them into different wallets to actually get access to their coins again, because a lot of people do just, they don't, they don't use hardware wallets in that side of the space. And a big part of the reason for that is, um, retarded nonsense published on Bitcoin.com, like an article they made years ago, um, explaining how putting Electrum on a USB stick that you can just run off of that is as good as a hardware wallet and things like that um so yeah um bitcoin.com is probably just chased off a giant chunk of the users of that wallet and just completely destroyed trust in it like just break the multi-sig which is actually widely used by that group of people for security like close source the wallet out of nowhere no heads up like this is what's going on in bcash land Yep. And then the next one, this is this is really hilarious. Um so BitPay um kind of deprecating BIP70, but kind of not. <laughs> and, uh, let, me, let me get to the not. Um so there's still BIP70, there's still the pay. Um but when you go to a BitPay invoice now instead of forcing the BIP70 payment flow. You you get a drop down thing where you click your wallet and see whether it supports BitPay or BIP70 or not. And if not, you manually enter in your, your address and you got to click the, the consent box for that and then click the, the cryptocurrency you're going to pay. And then if you can't scan the payment protocol code, then you click another thing and you got to copy and paste the individual address and the payment amount. And this is what's going to happen now. Instead of just getting rid of BIP70 entirely, um, they're, they're still supporting it, still encouraging their merchants to use it and just have the most retarded, obnoxious, like full of friction user experience you, you could imagine trying to make an online payment if, if you don't have something that supports BIP70. So like they, they, they've, it, it's this weird acknowledgement that they, this is actually affecting their company that you can't pay any invoice from them without BIP70 support, except using hacky third-party tools. But their solution, instead of just getting rid of it, is to just add an option that is the most obnoxious, unfriendly user experience ever to actually be able to pay it without BIP70. Wow, guys. Oh, so they they listen to the years of user experience feedback saying, we hate BIP70, it's confusing, no one knows how to use it, and the response is to just use more shitty user experience instead of getting rid of the shitty uh, payment option. It's wow, like... so, so how many years before they actually deprecate it and realize it's not, it's not the user experience that can be improved, it's just you have to get rid of BIP70. I think Stephen Pear will make a public comment acknowledging that two years after BitPay goes bankrupt. Well, so I'm going to say it here and now. Um, it's not a secret, but I'm working with a group of people to uh, fix the certified Bitcoin professionals exam. And one of the things that is on the CBP exam is BIP70. And I found that very strange because when you have... You know, when, when you want to ask a person 70 questions that determines whether they, you know, have knowledge worth recognizing in an area, why would you ask them about BIP70? It's like, never been relevant. No one except BitPay uses it. And it's, you know, it was such a bad decision to implement it in the first place. And it was a bad decision to keep it going when no one else uses it. Um, so BIP70, when the new exam comes out, is not going to be in the exam anymore. So, ha, I'm, I'm deprecating it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, goodbye, Dodo companies. Goodbye. Okay, so a little bit of breaking news that just came up uh, as we were recording this episode. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has announced that 
they will be helping a former employee of Kraken, the exchange Kraken, um, because uh, basically this employee apparently posted a uh, review um, or a reflection of their work experience on a site called Glassdoor, and Kraken is um, claiming that this was a breach of the severance agreement where they promised to not disclose confidential information or disparage or defame the company. And Kraken publicly responded to this person's review on the site Glassdoor. Um, they actually thanked the person for the feedback and wished them the best. But then uh, in May last year, they decided to um, claim that they had breached the severance contract. Uh, the EFF um, is claiming that this is a First Amendment case because they're saying this litigation is designed to harass and silence current and former Kraken employees for speaking about their experiences at the company. Kraken's efforts to unmask and sue its former employees discourages everyone from talking about their work and demonstrates why California courts must robustly protect anonymous speakers' First Amendment rights. Um, yeah, interesting. That's going to be something that I guess we talk about in next season if this goes anywhere, but when the EFF tends to highlight something, it tends to kind of blow up, but it's interesting because they tend to not get involved in stuff related to cryptocurrencies. They don't, they don't seem to like cryptocurrencies very much and they don't focus on it. So it's going to be interesting to see that they're, uh, taking on a case against a cryptocurrency exchange. Is this the the former OTC desk uh, lead who, who like claims that they were going to give him a commission that they never did, and then it, he ended up leaving because of that? Um, I've only just seen this, and I haven't checked. And they don't they don't say identify them as J Doe, so I don't know if it's that person. Okay. Well, I mean. Regardless of whether it is or isn't, I mean, it doesn't matter. But um, <clears throat> like I think this, I don't know what what it sounds to me like is is a little more complicated than this is just freedom of speech. Like I, obviously, like defamation. If if somebody gives an opinion on something, like get the fuck out of here. Like you can give your opinion on something. Uh, I think that aspect of it is crazy, and that that aspect of it absolutely is a freedom of speech issue but if there actually was confidential information released that he contractually obligated himself to keep confidential that aspect of this has absolutely nothing to do with freedom of speech and he fucked up if he did that like if you sign a contract for something like that and there are not reasons such as you being bound to like keep something private that that is illegal or, or something along those lines or immoral then no you you agreed to keep a secret buddy like if you broke that agreement <clears throat> like you deserve whatever consequences are in that contract and so i think this this is going to be a very sticky issue because some of this it absolutely is an issue with freedom of speech but another aspect of it absolutely is not and i think that is insanely dangerous if if this is tried or if they try to argue this or paint this as if it's nothing but a freedom of speech issue like if they try to argue that freedom of speech covers violating like agreements like that that is very dangerous i think and that that's absolute nonsense yeah i mean i think it would it it um cuz the the reason that they say that they can justify it being a freedom of uh, free speech case is because they're saying that you know this person posted the message anonymously and i haven't i haven't looked like i can't speak about whether the contents of the message is specific or revealing enough to you know kind of defeat the point of being anonymous but if they posted it anonymously and then crack in uh, they're saying that Kraken took efforts to unmask the speaker, you know, despite them having the anonymity. Um, now, I don't know. Un unmasking an anonymous person is 
I don't see how that's, I mean, that's tangentially related to free speech because obviously if you're anonymous, you're, you feel more free when you speak, especially about things that might be uncomfortable. But yeah, that's kind of, it's very tangential and you know, I, I can see why defamation would be a bit strong, especially if they it was an anonymous comment. But if they can prove that the anonymous comment was made by this person who was an informer employee and it was disparaging, then yeah, that's just a breach of contract. Like I I don't know how legally specific uh, they take disparagement, but that seems like a lower threshold than defamation um legally i would assume so but yeah we'll we'll see how this goes i would have to look into it more this is pretty breaking news because i think they just posted this Mm -hmm. yes i mean it's i mean there's not really much more we can say to that like it's this seems a lot more complicated than than just a freedom of speech issue but yeah you know i guess we'll see how it goes and touch on it when we get back from hiatus yeah, I guess that's uh, that wraps us up for the day. Final thoughts time. Uh, what do we got to end out the season on, Janine? Uh, well, my final thought is that, uh, well, I think we're going to be on hiatus or just coming out of hiatus during this period, but the start of the extradition trial for Assange in the UK is starting on February 24th. Um, I don't know how much of it is going to be viewable to even people who are on location because the courtroom is not big enough for the amount of people interested in attending. Uh, And also they won't be recording it uh, from inside. So you're just going to have to wait, you know, basically until it ends or from people who may be live tweeting from the location to know what's going on in there or actually go to Belmarsh prison and stand outside like the rest of us. Um, but yeah, it's basically the, the first week to three weeks is going to be the most intense because as far as I know, those days are actually scheduled out in terms of like, we, we at least need this much time. And then because for some reason the U S prosecutor team or sections of the U S prosecution team aren't going to be available. There's then going to be a gap where it restarts again in May. Uh, Don't know the reason for that, but yeah, the first week or so is going to be the most intense because that is where most of the important fighting is going to happen. So please show your support in whatever way you can, if you care about these issues. Mm Mm-hmm. And I guess you know, really the only thought I have, it, <clears throat> you're all, you're all going to call me a conspiracy nut and a lunatic. I don't fucking care. Um, so the, the, the entire situation going on with the coronavirus right now is completely obvious. The number we're getting out of China of cases and deaths are horseshit. It's just this virus has a long incubation period. So we won't really see how bullshit they are until things start getting worse in other countries that are not totalitarian communists. And it's, it's, it's really, it's just like, go buy a little bit of food to make sure you have some food stockpile and just pay more attention to washing your hands, not touching your face and things like that. Like at least do that. It's, it's going to be, at least a week or two until we get a better idea of what's actually going on. And like, yeah, like don't be a nut and go spend $10,000 prepping for the apocalypse, but don't stubbornly refuse to do simple common sense shit just because, Oh, that's a conspiracy theory. And yeah, uh, hopefully we'll be back from hiatus in two weeks and we'll not be in the middle of a, impending apocalypse so uh hopefully we'll see you then guys (laughs) adios bye
Ele só ignorava.